Good morning, colleagues. I'm Mosi Sagbenya, speaking from Ghana. I'm presenting on drivers and decent working condition among informal self-employees to inquiry workers in Ghana. In this presentation, I will take you through the introduction, problem statement, theoretical framework, methodology, findings, conclusion, and some recommendations. I'll start with in the introduction. The informal economy dominates in employment creation in developing economies and developed economies. In Africa, it is estimated that 86% of the population are in the informal economy, 68% in Arab states, and 40% in America, as well as 25% in Central Asia. In terms of the informal economy, self employed dominate or self employed workers dominate the number of people in the informal economy. That is, about 90% of them are own account workers. Self-employed population in the informal economy provide both employment, income, and contribute about 17 to 30% to the GDP of nations. And Ghana equally benefit from the informal economy. It is saying that for the informal economy, especially the self-employed that play this pivotal role, to continue to play this role of providing employment for other informal category of workers and for family members would largely depend on good working condition, term as decent working condition to be able to continue playing this significant role. Previous studies have been on operational limitation faced by entrepreneurs. And these studies have been studied from macro perspective. You can talk about studies like Anka et al., ILO 2015, Hussein and Ednot 2018, ILO 2012, have all been done at the macro and the, from quantitative perspective. In terms of Ghana, Comedia Sampo and the FUPI 2013, Nanawutu 2016, upon 2019, have done some sort of work. But these studies have all been in at the macro level and from quantitative perspective, making it difficult to find respondent or workers' own voice in understanding what their working conditions are. And for that matter, this study sought to understand workers from their own perspective, their own narration, from their own world, how they describe their own working condition. This is very relevant because the, lit the literature that is available do not fill this gap and there's that lacuna that this study want to fill. Decent working condition also remain a global developmental agenda to 2030 under the Sustainable Development Goal. Therefore, it is very relevant to be considered in the time. That is to know, ever since 20, 2002, that ILO launched the Disney World concept in Ghana, to what extent, is, especially in the central region, that it also, to what extent has it worked. And then, there's a theoretical perspective. Three theories have been used to explain issues in the informal economy, such as modernization theory, looking at informal economy from the lack of development perspective, neoliberal theory, looking at informal economy from high tax perspective, and the political economy, which used to analyze informal economy from minimal state intervention. These three theories have looked at informal economy at a macro level and failed to explain why individuals participate the informal economy or decide not to participate. Thus, this study saw the need to bring institutional theory on board to explain how the informal and the formal institutions shape the working condition of self-employed workers in Ghana. The study was done in Ghana, specifically in the central region of Ghana, where the decent web concept of ILO was launched and piloted since 2003. The Cape Coast Metropolis was chosen because in the whole central region, it's in the Cape Coast Metropolis where 
metropolis that where that is where you can find this informal self-employed quarry workers there are other informal quarry workers but they are workers employees who are working and with uh, formalized organizational companies but that matter did not fall and that is the focus of this study in terms of instrument interview guide focus group discussion observation guide were used to understand respondents from their own perspective and the data analysis was done after being after doing the transcription and using adaptive approach of coding which combined both interpretative and deductive approach of coding at the end of the day qualitative interpretative analysis was done using thematic presentation which is based on ILO design work indicators in terms of finding it was found that the income level was the daily income level of these workers was 0 0.99 far below ILO estimation of 2.5 2.25 a day meaning these workers cannot take care of themselves and additional members of their families because of this low income it was realized that they decided to work more than the required standard working hour which is 48 hours but they work for 72 hours and they had their children supporting them after school it was realized that poor income led to their inability to buy protective personal protective equipment and for that matter they were exposed to respiratory infection and the hospitals in this area or these areas were sampled and it was confirmed that several of these workers reported respiratory tract infection at these health facilities and it was key to know that they do not even take into consideration the long-term effect of silicosis which is incurable due to the dusty working environment they do not have any formal social security provision except that they invest in their own children to take care of them there was no state provision for both medical care and social security organizing they don't have any formal organizing but they have membership based organization which is a welfare sort to take care of them that also became a different it was realized that need for livelihood and general unemployment opportunity was what pushed them into this sort of activities it was realized that because the institution that is supposed to play the leadership role such as the labor department failed to inspect blaming it on lack of logistic and human resource made the condition of these workers very poor because there was then a lack of policy to address their issue in conclusion it was realized a lack of institutional policing or lack of formal institutional support for the workers and then uh, low income making it impossible for them to buy protective clothing make them make their working condition very poor or indecent the non-financial form of social security they claim they are investing to take care of their future also seems not to be sustainable because of the dusty related because of the dust related environment which may not occur well for the very children who are helping them then. generally there was unemployment opportunities and the need for livelihood push them into this sort of therefore it was recommended that the labor department should be retooled with the right logistic and the human being or the right more resource to be able to police and ensure that there's a policy direction to address in the indecent working condition of this working alternative livelihood program should also be should be brought on board to support parents of these children involved in quarry activities and workers should collectively purchase stock in bulk and transport their waste so that they can save costs and then they should form strong association to bargain with suppliers to get some concession so that they can sell at a rate that will not be in competition with their suppliers which will put them at serious disadvantage position thank you for your audience from Ghana. God bless you. Hi, this is David Beck. My colleague Jill Timms and myself will now be delivering a presentation to you entitled Capturing Capitals in Order to Deliver Sustainable Development from the Ground Up in South Africa's Western Cape. The underpinning research for this particular presentation results from four years of engagement with the Grootbos Foundation in South Africa 
Initially, we looked into its Sport for Development programmes and undertook an evaluation of that. And in more recent times, we've been involved in evaluating the entire foundation and its uh, delivery over the last 15 years. Next slide, number two. Our presentation addresses the question of how the private sector can engage with community actors in the pursuit of sustainable development. We will be exploring the experiences of one particular foundation in South Africa which has proven particularly successful and that is the Futbos Foundation in the Western Cape. Our presentation will have a fairly standard presentation uh, structure. We'll begin by examining the theoretical questions relating to the issue at hand, i.e. the relationship between the private sector and sustainable development at a community level. We'll talk about the context for our case study, provide some background to the foundation and its mission. Then we will look at its programmes, a quick snapshot of some of its impacts, which show how incredibly successful it's been. Then we will move on to the more evaluative part of the presentation where we'll consider what have been the actual drivers for the foundation's success, which we will show has occurred through the ability to capture certain key capitals. And then we'll reflect upon the findings within the context of our theoretical framework. I'll now hand over to Jill, who will talk about the theoretical background to this paper considering the private sector's role in development. So on to new slide number three. Hello, and I'm very pleased to be taking part. So I'd like to just start with a stepping back to consider the wider context of the relationship between the private sector and sustainable development. Seeing this as part of the continually evolving discourse and practice of corporate social responsibility where businesses are called on to be a force for positive development, such as in the organisation Business Fights Poverty, recognising the critics of corporate social irresponsibility, which might include scandals or human rights abuses, and as well seeing the increasingly tangled lines of responsibility that result from, for example, complex supply chains and ownership structures. One thing we can say is that role of business in development and also the expected standards of ethical practice can be seen to reflect power relations in the global system. So this might be where CSR can be considered as imperialistic, orientalist or ethnocentric. What we'd like to do with our case is to see how these types of international CSI programmes can play out on a global stage and how some of the pitfalls might be avoided through community engagement. New slide number four. The foundation is linked to the Hutbos Eco Lodge, which is located in South Africa's Western Cape province. You can see from the map that the Eco Lodge is near to a town called Hans Bay, which is located on the, uh, the coastal fringes of the Overstrand municipality. It is about 200 miles uh, away from Cape Town, which is found to the west. It's a very rural coastal region. The lodge is located in the Cape Floristic region, which is one of the most biodiverse areas of the world, which is one of the major reasons why an entrepreneur called Michael Lutzeyer decided in 1996 to uh, invest in building the first stages of the Eco Lodge, which you can see in the, the photograph in the lower part of the slide. Uh, the target market for the Eco Lodge has always been high net worth individuals, and the lodge has proven very successful over the last two decades in attracting uh, people with significant amounts of disposable income to come and stay and enjoy the exclusivity of the lodge. Now it's been very important for the, uh, the lodge to maintain its natural environment around it in order to attract these people, um, so there's been a lot of work been put into conservation in that time. Next slide, number five. The geographical context is very important here because the lodge and its associated foundation is located in an area with immense socio-economic challenges, um, which of course are embedded in the country's history 
of apartheid and the racial disparities that that has produced and which have endured uh, for more than a quarter of a century since apartheid officially was ended. So we find in this area very high unemployment, especially amongst young people, many other social problems as well, such as drugs, alcohol, gangs, various forms of illegal activity. The area is actually a centre for varying forms of poaching, whether of wild flowers or indeed of uh, high value fish, which end up being exported via the gangs into, into China. Opportunities for formal employment are relatively limited. Traditionally, the area is focused very much around the fishing industry as a source of employment. So there are still some fish processing factories in the area. Tourism has become very, very important to the region. It is actually the, almost one of the world's centre for white shark cage diving, which attracts uh, many thousands of people to the area every year, although many of them just on day trips from Cape Town. Um, agriculture is important as well um, in the broader region, although it does not really soak up a huge amount of employment. But ecotourism is increasingly being seen um, as an important way forward. New slide number six. In 2003, the Eco Lodge formally set up a foundation with a vision to conserve the Cape Floristic region and to provide upliftment opportunities for the communities living around the lodge, which would include people in Hans Bay, the town of Stamford, um, and areas within that general hinterland. Their broader mission was to conserve the u unique C Cape Floral Kingdom and to develop sustainable livelihoods through ecotourism, enterprise development, sports development and education. The Foundation's activities now coalesce around three core programmes. First of all, Green Futures, which started as the Green Futures College in 2003 and through which much of the Foundation's conservation work is undertaken. Secondly, the Football Foundation, which despite also being called a foundation, is a component of the, the broader Hrutbos Foundation. This started in 2008 in the build-up to the 2010 FIFA Soccer World Cup. Then we have Siakula, which started as the Growing the Futures Agricultural and Life Skills College, and that is uh, going to encompass all income-generating activities for the foundation. The Foundation's managers have proven particularly adept at raising funding from a wide range of sources, including corporate donors, individual donors, funding grants such as the South African National Lottery, and also raising money through income generating activities. For example, M Michael Lutzeyer has started a scheme whereby local artists can paint the local flora to be found on the nature reserve surrounding Rutbos, which given that there are many hundreds if not thousands of individual species of plant um, offers an almost bottomless pit of opportunities for, for painting and then the prints of these pictures are then sold to guests after being exhibited in the lodge. An example of this uh, entrepreneurial activity can be seen on the slide here. New slide number seven. The foundation is having a tremendous range of beneficial impacts across an array of spheres within the local area which are highly consistent with its mission and its vision. For example, its conservation impacts have been tremendous and they've tackled environmental threats directly, for example, removing all alien vegetation from the private nature reserves surrounding the Rootboss Lodge and also supporting local landowners in doing exactly the same on their land as well, which has tremendous benefits in terms of improving biodiversity and ecosystem services in, in the wider region, which then plays out in terms of benefits for ecotourism and so forth. Um, they've also acted as a kind of hub disseminating best practice amongst other institutions in the local area in terms of conservation. The impacts on society have been tremendous through sport for development programmes, promoting gender education, citizenship um, and providing a lot of support for the more disadvantaged folk in society. For example, during the ongoing COVID-19 um, pandemic, there have been tremendous problems in terms of uh, access to, to food. You know, food, food insecurity has been a very notable problem and the foundation has acted very quickly to support pe people within the community. There have also been notable impacts upon the local economy. Jobs have been created directly and indirectly through the training opportunities provided through the foundation and also through the career path opportunities that have been available within the lodge itself. 
and we'll talk a bit more about that on the next slide. And the institutional fabric of the region has also been strengthened because the Lodges Act has come like a glue for different types of organisations, such as community-based organisations, local government, um, local businesses to come together and to connect with um, sort of national and international players. And what's been critical here has been the foundation's reputation and standards, which have been critical to its credibility. And just as one stat to try and capture this, um, according to our evaluations, the foundation has interacted with 30,000 local beneficiaries over a period of 15 years. New slide number eight. So just to give one quick example of the outcomes from one particular program, so if we just look at the Green Futures activities, um, Green Futures has provided opportunities for people to be trained in guiding, food and beverage, uh, housekeeping and horticulture, um, reaching out to over 200 individuals in the last few years. And the analysis indicates that the folk who've been through this training have enjoyed much higher employment rates than, uh, than is average in the region or indeed nationally, and that people's longer term incomes are, tend to be enhanced by 20%. And very importantly in these areas where underemployment is a huge problem is that many people are able to access promotion opportunities as well relatively quickly after starting their work due to the quality of the training they have received through the Green Futures programmes. Next slide, number nine. So one of the most interesting aspects of um, the foundation is its relationship with the Rutbos Lodge itself. And indeed, the two can be described as having an intrinsic, symbiotic, mutually beneficial relationship. And indeed, people say it's impossible to imagine the one without the other. So the lodge has requirements for certain goods and services which the foundation is able to provide. So, for example, if one just thinks about the food that is um, eaten at the lodge, um, obviously the kind of guests that are being attracted to an eco lodge are very keen on having quality, fresh, organic food, you know, short supply chains, all those kind of things that, that really appeal to the, the high end consumer. And those are the things the foundation can provide. And what is important to note here, though, of course, is that it isn't just sort of like some kind of like kind charitable act. The, the foundation has to provide goods and services of a very, very high quality in order to match up with the expectations of the lodge's guests. And through the lodge, the foundation is able to gain access to donors. After all, these are high net worth individuals who often work for major corporations who will stay at the lodge. Um, which can quite often lead to uh, donations of one form or another, access to networks, and a lot of pro bono stuff happens as well, just in terms of access to um, advice around finance, accounting, marketing, and so forth. And all these things provide the foundation with a great number of advantages, which help it to operate with strong governance and to be able to operate highly effectively. Next slide, number 10. So let's step back and ask ourselves, why has this foundation been so successful? After all, it's reached a wide number of beneficiaries. It's been able to operate in a financially successful way. It's been able to attract a lot of external attention, a lot of awards. Funding keeps on increasing. More donors seem to be prepared to uh, you know, provide money for the fund and the demand is greater. And of course, it also has strong acceptance in the local community. All these things are very important indicators of success. So what have been the drivers behind all of this? Well, we boil it down really to the ability to pull together three forms of capital, financial capital, human capital, and social capital. Um, and it's the way these three interrelate that has enables the uh, foundation to continue to operate in a highly successful way. So they can attract funding, they can entice donors, they can generate increasing income. They're able to attract and retain skilled, knowledgeable and passionate staff, which um, is, is an incredible benefit to the to the organisation. There is very strong leadership, a culture of teamwork, and they're also able to draw volunteers from across the world. And social capital underpins it all. There is a degree of high degree of trust uh, locally, regionally, nationally and even internationally with, with the foundation and the, the lodge which oversees it. Um, there was a high level of legitimacy, which, given the political sensitivities around a lot of their work, is a you know a very significant achievement. Ability to access networks and to gain influence. All these things come together and enable the lodge and the foundation to deliver highly successful programs for sustainable development. New slide number eleven. 
So what have been the notable features of the project in terms of the relationship with uh, the private sector? So just quite quickly we can say that local stakeholders have successfully connected with international corporations. You know, the project has involved, for example, links with Barclays Bank, Absa Bank, uh, the Premier League soccer in, in the UK, uh, as well as some German corporations as well. And it's been able to draw down upon the latter's financial and human resources. And these have been critical factors in, in leading to the success of the foundation. Equally, engagement with the project has enabled those corporations to meet their own strategic targets, whether in the realms of reinforcing their licence to operate within their markets or meeting CSR targets. And the critical thing has been the trust those corporations have had in Rutbos and its governance structures. The end result has been a sustainable and resilient project, which has not been caught up with red tape or subjected to political capture. New slide number 12. So a few brief reflections to draw this together. And the first is how useful it is to actually study mega events as they're really quite unique opportunities that show what's possible when local stakeholders get the chance to engage with major corporations at the same time as corporations are able to free up budgets for their CSR programme because of the exposure they're going to get via this global platform. And we can see when these elements come together, there are three key parts that have been very important in this case. The first is a very strong institutional context being necessary, where the project's embedded in all levels of organisation. Also, the need for strong management and effective networking to really enable local stakeholders to make the most of the influential networks they are connected to. And finally, effective governance really being about incorporating transparency, accountability and responsibility throughout all elements of the project. OK, thank you. New slide number 13. And here are the key references we've used in drawing together this presentation. Final slide number 14. Well, thank you very much for watching and listening to this presentation. Um, we hope you'll agree that this is a particularly interesting example of development from the ground up, um, whereby a foundation has successfully worked with the private sector in order to provide a range of sustainability outcomes in terms of the environment, the economy and society. We look forward to your questions. Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Kingsley Deo and I'm presenting the role of indigenous industries in driving the sustainable development goals in Nigeria, a case study of Dangote Industries Limited. Indigenous industries play crucial roles in the industrialization process and economic growth of both developed and developing countries. This they do by enhancing regional economic balance, putting an end to capital flights, creating employment opportunities and promoting resource utilization necessary for economic development and growth. Extractive industries are those whose primary activities involve extraction of natural resources, which directly impact the environment. Mismanagement of these activities could be detrimental to the environment and the livelihood of host communities in which they are located. And we have seen this occur several times in the past with um, host communities and extractive industries, one blaming the other for inadvertently polluting maybe a waterway or destroying farmlands over the years. This paper examined the actions of Dangote Industries Limited Nigeria, DIL, in driving development and achieving the SDGs. The paper also identified if there was a deliberate action in DIL in terms of company policies or directives that facilitated the achievement of SDGs. Dangote Industries Limited was established in 1978 with sole aim of providing local value added products and services that meet the basic needs of the populace. The company is headquartered in Nigeria with corporations in 10 African countries. Dangote Industries Limited has several subsidiaries which include uh, cement production, Dangote sugar, Dangote flour, Dangote salt, Dangote beverages, pasta and real estate. DIL is currently investing in the oil and gas sector, petrochemicals, fertilizer and agricultural sector. 
in Nigeria, Dangote Industries Limited has four companies listed in the Nigerian Stock Exchange as part of its vision of being a world-class organization. These companies include Dangote Sugar Refinery PLC, Dangote Cement PLC DCP, Dangote Flour Mills, and Nascon Allied Industries PLC. Dangote Cement PLC is the leading cement conglomerate in Africa and Nigeria's biggest indigenous com company. It's an important part of DIL and the DCP is listed on the Nigerian Stock Exchange, but is owned primarily by its parent company, Dangote Industries Limited. With operations in three different locations in Nigeria and across 10 African countries, the social, environmental, and economic impact of DCP is significant and diverse. As a leading extractive global company, as a leading global extractive company, DCP is committed to ensuring that their operations are fully aligned with the group-wide sustainability vision. The strategy used by Dangote for their sustainability leadership drive is premised on three key ideas. One, the foundation, with the aim to play to create new value. In this, in the, uh, with this idea, Dangote complies, Dangote Industries Limited complies with internal policies, Nigeria's internal policies, international standards and regulations, and has implemented new data gathering systems to raise effectiveness and manage risks quicker. The second key idea is the change in management, which, which is premised by the play to capitalize. Here, Dangote Industries Limited has developed an internal culture to enable transformation across the whole group. And with the Industries Limited is also more proactive in their health, safety, and environmental risk management processes and practices. The adoption of a pragmatic stakeholder management approach also guides engagement with stakeholders. And lastly, and most importantly, is the leadership play to win idea. By strengthening market leadership and their position in sub Saharan Africa, Dangote Industries Limited has shaped their transformation in a more responsible manner. Now, uh, the Dangote way, this is, um, this, this, this key term is, it, it guides their actions. This is their principles and leadership ideology. Here, the, the main focus, the main focus is that business is not necessarily all about financial profits. It's about making impacts. And for more than 20 years before the inception and the um, creation of Dangote Cement, Dangote was just a trading company. And with the inception of with the uh, creation of Dangote Cement, they, they, they came up with this idea that uh, Dangote Cement isn't just about cement. It's not just a company, but it's about improving people's lives. The Dangote Way is based upon seven sustainability pillars that support their approach to creating a world-class multinational manufacturing, manufacturing company. And these pillars are still premised on those three key ideas that I spoke about earlier. The model shows the interlinkages between the pillars with the emphasis on governance, that is governance, which talks about the institutional and cultural pillars, the license to operate, which talks about the operational and the environmental pillars, and the operations, which talks about the economic, social, and financial pillars. Now, the cultural pillar. The cultural pillar embodies Dangote Industries Limited's core values in the way they carry out business. It includes a respect for cultural diversity and giving back to society, to the societies in which they operate. To achieve this, Dangote Industries Limited actively encourages teamwork, empowerment, inclusion, equity, integrity, and meritocracy within the organization. Now, these cultural pillars are also in line with the regulatory, the regulatory policies of the diverse organizations to which um, Dangote belongs. At the bottom of this uh, slide, it is clear to see that uh, there's a legend which describes each of the organizations listed on, the, um, on this table. Now, uh, for GCC, GCC stands for the Global Cement and Concrete Association. The UNGC stands for United Nations Global Compact. The NCCG stands for Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance. GRI, Global Reporting Initiative, SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, NSE, Nigerian Stock Exchange, IFC, International Financial Corporation. 
if you look across the, the, the table, you'll see that while complying with this um, regulatory policies, Dangote has also been able to achieve SDG goal four, that's quality education, SDG goal five, gender equality, 10, reducing inequalities, 11, sustainable cities and communities, SDG 16, SDG 17. Now, uh, moving on to the financial pillar, it's also clear here that Dangote, that to achieve sustainable financial health through a business model that delivers strong returns to shareholders whilst creating value in the economies in which Dangote Industries operates. Dangote has decided to sell high quality products at affordable prices, and this is supported by excellent customer service. And while doing this, this financial pillar, it is clear to see that Dangote has been able to achieve SDG Goal 8, which has to do with decent work and economic growth, and SDG Goal 11, sustainable cities and communities. For the institutional pillar, Dangote has decided to build a world-class institution centered around corporate governance, best practices, and sustainable, sustainability principles that promote legal and regulatory, compli regulatory compliance, transparency, and business continuity. So while doing this, Dangote has also been able to achieve SDG Goal 8, Decent Work and Economic Growth, 16, Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions, and SDG Goal 17, Partnership for the Goals. For the, um, for the economic pillar, here, Dangote, Dangote's drive is to promote inclusive, sustainable economic growth, self-reliance, self-sufficiency, and industrialization across Africa by establishing efficient production facilities and developing resilient local economies in strategic locations and key markets. And whilst doing this, while based on the while using this pillar, it is clear that Dangote has been able to achieve SDG goal 1, 2, 8, 11, and 16. For, um, for the environmental pillar, Dangote, Design, uh, Dangote Industries Limited creates sustainable environmental management practices through a proactive approach to address the challenges and opportunities of climate change while optimizing their performance in energy efficiency, water usage, and emissions. Whilst doing this, whilst using it on this pillar, they've been able to achieve SDG goal 6, 7, 9, 12, and 13. For the operational pillar, Dangote has been able to achieve SDG goal 8, 9, 12, 13. The aim here is to serve and satisfy their markets by working together with partners to deliver the best products and services to valued customers and stakeholders through continuous um, product improvement new business development, employing state-of-the-art technologies and systems to constantly optimize um, cost efficiencies. For the social pillar, which is a very key pillar on which um, Dangote Industries Limited uh, operates, Dangote, Industri Dangote Cement uh, creates a learning environment and platform that allows their employees to grow and achieve their full potential whilst adhering to the highest standards of health and safety. Now, whilst doing this, they've been able to achieve SDG Goal 1, that's no poverty, SDG Goal 3, good health and well-being, SDG Goal 4, quality education, SDG Goal 5, gender equality, SDG 10, reduced inequalities, SDG 16, and um, yeah, which is peace, justice, and strong institutions. Now, um, in the course of the year 2018, Dangote Industries Limited spent a whopping 1.5 billion naira on corporate social responsibility, and a major chunk of this amount of money was spent on donations and grants to the government, with uh, another being donations and grants to charity and um, health and. Um, health infrastructure and donation and grants to host communities. Some of the ways in which Dangote drives the sustainability is um, they utilize extensive stakeholders management, materiality assessment, and baseline surveys against global peers. They train and engaged 500 sustainability champions, including management of all DCP Africa plants, on sustainability reporting based on GRI global standards. They deployed Sustainability Week, which mobilized hundreds of employees to engage in 
voluntary waste management, community infrastructural development, and boost social performance across seven African countries and nine DCP plants. Dangote Industries Limited also drives sustainability by developing SharePoint sustainability data management systems for data collection across 13 DCP Africa plants for sustainability reporting, which is to be which have been automated by 2019. Now, various initiatives they also carried out in 2018 include um, some in Nigeria, which included um, environmental sanitation and economic impact project at their headquarters at Oniru Block, Makers Village, that's in Lagos. Ibese donation of materials to Ibese markets, women, and some others, and um, across Africa in Cameroon, donation of do educational materials and visits to bilingual secondary schools, that's at Diedo. In the Congo, rehabilitation of clinics and roads in Bunza district in Tanzania, tree planting around plant and sustainability awareness programs for plant staff. In Ghana, beach sanitation in Tema, in Senegal, plant sanitation and sustainability awareness programs. In conclusion, it is clear to see that Dangote Cement PLC is the only subsidiary of Dangote Industries Limited that has consciously included sustainability in every aspect of our activities. And the cultural pillar, the, the DCP sustainability pillars, as stated earlier, the seven pillars are linked with 15 of the 17 United Nations SDG goals, SDGs. And the cultural pillar provides a framework for integrating sustainability into their business processes and values. Uh, in, this, in this slide are um, images as obtained from uh, 2018 Sustainability Week. Um, initiated and implemented by Dangote Industries Limited. Thank you very much and do enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.